Sometimes as a spirit lead, we minister before the meeting. But tonight, he especially said to minister after the meeting. And uh, I am always very obedient to him. I believe the reason he asked to do so is because of the message. Tonight we are looking at number four, the laying on of hands. These are a series of six messages based on the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, and we call them the elementary principles, the foundational principles. And tonight, it's one of those nights where we will lay hands. Normally, I do not lay hands when I minister, we flow with the Holy Spirit. But tonight, in line with the message that he has spoken, we will exercise the laying on of hands. And at the end of the message, we'll describe the different areas that we'll be laying hands for. We are just flowing along with what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. Laying, laying on our hands is another one of the elementary principles we have learned three so far tonight is number four. We have uh, looked at repentance from dead works, faith towards God, baptism, and now number four, the laying on of hands. I came to understand the laying on of hands and its importance more or less by accident rather than being taught. My background is from a Baptist church. I was born again in a CNAC church in Joe Barrow. And then after that, I joined my friends to go to the Baptist church. I was never taught about the laying on of hands. I was taught about my salvation. I was taught that Jesus died for my sins. I follow up with the Navigators program, which is a series of follow-up things about forgiveness of sins and all that God has done in Jesus. But I was not taught about the laying on of hands and many other areas like the baptism of the Spirit or the doctrine of healing. So when I went to the Baptist seminary in 1976, I still did not know anything about laying on our hands. Why did the Bible put it among the foundational truths? There are some things that you can get no other way except by the laying on our hands. Some things are taught. Some things are caught. And some of those things that are taught we can only get by getting into the Word and receiving the teaching from there. Like sound theology, biblical doctrines, we need to be taught. When we are not taught, we cannot receive some of those things that God's Word speaks about. On the other hand, some things are caught. There's no other way we can get it except by an experiential impartation. And one of the means that God used to bring an impartation is the laying on our hands. If, as I look back, if I had been taught the laying on our hands, I would have grown even more spiritually. That is what the Bible puts it among the foundational truths so that the young Christian know that laying on our hands is not just for healing. So sometimes there's nothing wrong with us and we ask ourselves, why should I go on and have, my, have, have hands laid on my nice comb head? I'm not sure the preacher washes his hands either. <laughs> I know it's interesting to be a part of the body of Christ, to be in a congregation looking at those preachers preaching and we are hard away and learning from them, sometimes it's interesting from the preacher's point of view. Because when you lay hands, you really feel the different types of hair. And it was only in the past few years that I've been feeling hard hair. They put mousse on your hair. <laughs> sometimes it, hey, it, it, it's sticking to my hand. <laughs> and, uh, 
If I had been taught the laying on of hands earlier, I would have known to go up to receive laying on hands. I used to, as a Baptist, I used to sit in a back seat. When I was converted, or, or rather got into the Holy Spirit, I began to love the front seat. And uh, I'm not saying anything wrong with you, you fellows in the back there. The front seat, you can get the anointing plus the uh, precious saliva. <laughs> but I used to sit in the back seat and, and when uh, some prayer is going on, and as a Baptist, sometimes I, I, I was curious, I, I went to some of these Pentecostal meetings in the early days, and, and I see them laying hands, but there's something in me that, that just refused to, to drag myself up to have hands laid on me. Part of it is pride. It's quite humbling to have somebody put their hands on you. Part of it is because I was not taught about the value of laying on a hand. But I learned it in a very experiential way. Sometimes it's in the word, but it takes an experience to jog us to the impact of a truth. There are a lot of things already in the Bible. But only when we experience it, we begin to really look for it in the Bible and realize that it's there all the time. We read, but we don't see. We read, but don't read. And that was when I was... I, I, I was baptized in the Spirit as I was seeking God on one of those fasts and I was so hungry for more of God. I wanted more of God. I knew I needed God in order to fulfill and be in the ministry of God successfully. And I used to seek God a lot. And in one of those times, I had an experience of speaking in tongues. But I still didn't know the value of speaking in tongues, not the experience of it. And I never practiced it and it was just left on the shelf. A few Assembly of God uh, students came from their church and attended the seminary too. And I became friends with them. And one day, one of them took me to see a very, very old missionary. I went along and it, I remember it was a rainy day and uh, I was sitting on his, uh, as a pillion rider on his motorbike and we went as fast, we went as fast as we could quickly to the house and uh, uh, at that time I had a need. I, I was spiritually drained, I was spiritually dry and I just need the touch of God and, and, and I knew I needed something. And that day uh, he took me to this old missionary, a friendly gospel missionary, and he knocked on the door of his house. We, we could see through the glass that he was, he had just been through some ministry and was lying down the sofa resting. And when we knocked, he came up and uh, then he uh, received us and, and the, uh, my friend asked him to pray for me. And there I was, uh, just didn't know what to do. So you just just let him pray. He just went into this tongue language. He had a very booming voice. <laughs> and uh, at that time, very strangely, the lightning was also flashing and the thunder was rolling. Part of the thing, I guess. And God has his sense of humor. And this was a booming voice there. And, and I just didn't know what to do. So I, I, I closed my eyes, didn't want to see what was there. When he put his hands on me, I literally felt something coming out of his hands and going into me. From that day onward, the confusion that I had in my mind about the Holy Spirit, the confusion that I had about the baptism in the street, I had an experience but he didn't understand it, I still didn't believe that that was what I had. And a lot of the confusion that I had slowly fell away. But there was something else. I could smell, I could feel something tangible. I did open my eyes a bit to see whether he was using anything. <laughs> I mean, this is a denomination of Christian. I was like that. And, uh, but I did, uh, it was just his hand. Big hand, so. And... I went back that 
sensation was still there. Something dropped deep in the in the belly. I could still feel it all the way on the pillion motorbike there, going back. I didn't feel any. I only felt that thing inside, bouncing. Now I was a seminary student. That time I was in the second year, and I was wondering, what is this? My mind don't can't comprehend what is this. And I went back, looked into a concordance, and I checked through my Bible, saying, well, what is this laying on my hand? Uh, it's it's something, something different. I've never examined it in the Word before. And as I started examining the Word on the laying on my hand, I began to realize there was something there that could have speed up, speeded up my spiritual growth in ways that that would have been a blessing and would have I would not have to go to some of those problems, some of those confusion if I had learned the secret of laying on my hands and receive it since I was young and I need to receive it. From that day onwards I knew there was something there. And every time I came across a man of God who who I, I see some value in their life, I come to them and say, would you lay your hands on me? <laughs> I wanted more now. I realized there's something there. And uh, later on, I still have those letters in my file. Every time I read a good book or something uh, by somebody who touched my life, I wrote to them, I wrote to Maurice Cerullo and told him, I believe in the laying on a hand, pray for me for a blessing. Through the letter, you lay hands on the letter, I take the letter and put it on me. <laughs> and still the letter on file. I wrote to Charles and Francis Hunter, I wrote to uh, Kenneth Hagin and uh, wow, yes. <laughs> Remember, spiritually I was a desperado. When something is in God and something is there, I believe in getting all of it. I don't miss anything. Um, so I still have those letters on file. I know that there's something there. In 1981 when I traveled uh, to visit John Austin, in his church, I stayed for several months in his church guest house. And while there, we visited, we stayed in his church and saw his services. And uh, before we left, we went into the office, my wife and I, and I, I, I said, I believe in the laying on of hands. I believe that there's something that can be imparted. And I said, can you lay your hands on that and impart that into it? That which is on your life. We knelt down and when he prayed for us, something happened. And what, what happened? In 1981, uh, we, we started a church in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, uh, for several months before we left for the United States. And my preaching was different in those days. I was a fire and brimstone preacher. I remember my first sermon in seminary. Uh, before the students graduate, they got one chance to share in the chapel time. So all the graduating final year students had one chance to share in chapel time. So I went to the uh, pulpit, and from the pulpit I said that this seminary is a cemetery! All the professors eyes fall out. <laughs> and uh, fire and brimstone. I don't preach the same way I preach today. Now it's more pastoral. <laughs> Before that, I, I used to go around and, and, and say, Praise God! Praise God! Praise God! You still got a little bit of that. <laughs> Fire and green stone. Uh, something happened to me when Austin laid his, John Austin laid his hands on me. There was a different anointing that started flowing when I preached. It was tangible. I knew it was different. And when I came back, the people told me that I sounded different. Last time when I preached, their eyeballs popped out. <laughs> they looked very angry. Now when I preach, they laugh and they smile. Now I don't purposely try to joke. But it's different. And they said, what happened? They must have been that those hand-laying experiences. The part of the anointing of the pastor came into my life. Of strengthen. There's something about the laying on of hands that we must not miss. 
And a lot of the men of God, uh, they come across it and and uh, and whenever that I say there's something there for laying your hands, don't don't get too proud to say that you don't need anybody. Even if somebody has something different from your life that that you could seek a different uh, fellowship and impartation, and then lay hands on you. When Agong Bangao uh, visited our church and he shared his testimony, and after he shared and, and, and he prayed for the people, at the end of it, I said, Would you lay hands on me? Now, my ministry was already expanding and wide, it's reaching to the world, and, and he is just reaching to this nation. But I recognized there's something there, and I said, Would you pray a blessing for me? And I let him lay his hands on me. And I learned that there are some things that can be taught, but there are some things that have to be caught or imparted. There's no other way except to the laying on of hands. Why hands? Hands seem to be the place where power is concentrated. There is light in this place here, in this hall. But the light came from light bulbs. The, the intensity of the light is concentrated on those light bulbs. In those filaments in, in the bulbs. We can have the light right where we are sitting. Huh? Right here, we can see the light on the floor, on the carpet. There's light all over the place. But the intensity and the concentration of the light is in the filament in the light bulb. There is, the power of God is all over. The power of God is open to wherever we want to receive. But there is such a thing as what I call places where the power is concentrated on. Then we need to the book of Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. In singing the triumph that they have over Pharaoh, the Egyptians recognized something about God. In, uh, I mean, the Israelites recognized something about God. Exodus 15, verse 6. Your right hand, O God, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. This is only one scripture. All over the place in the Bible when it talks about God's power, it speaks about His hands. His hands of power. Now what does it mean by His, his right hand becoming glorious? There was power issuing forth from his hand. In the book of Acts chapter 4, the early church was praying and they seemed to understand this truth. In their prayers they say, in verse 29 and 30, Now Lord, look on their treads, and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They are asking God to stretch forth his hands to release the power of God. There are many, many other places that we don't have time to go through, but you examine the word hand and right hand, many, many times it speaks about the power of God in, in his hand. Even Jesus, when he talked about casting out devils, and uh, he, they were saying that he cast out by some other thing, he says, if, if I cast out uh, uh, devils by the finger of God, in, in one version, in one gospel, another word, gospel says by, by the Spirit of God, the other says by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God is come on you, the finger of God. God's power is concentrated in His hands. Now let's examine something about Jesus' ministry. There are five purposes or five reasons for the laying on of hands. Number one is for healing. 
And in the area of healing, we can also see proof that the power of God is concentrated in His hands, and we are made in the image of God. When the anointing comes, the anointing can be in all over the place, and people can just receive what they want without the laying on of hands. But when the power of God is not in great manifestation, you can always still go to where the concentration is hands. Let me prove it from the Bible. First of all, let's look at the Gospel of Mark chapter 1 and see how Jesus started his ministry. When Jesus... Hallelujah. Concentration of sound. When Jesus started his ministry, there was... People have to learn to release faith in them. The laying on hands got some basic principles involved. Number one, you have to believe that the one laying on hands on you has what has the power that you need or has what you need. If you don't exercise faith in that, then it's laying empty hands on empty head. Can I hear this expression? If we don't release it, now the laying on our hands itself is a simple thing. I mean, every song big and heavy that has a hand can lay hands. Even a child can lay hands, right? What makes a difference? It's faith that is released. It's not just hands. It's faith that is released. There are principles on laying on our hands. Number one, we have to believe that the instrument that, that is laying hands on us has what we need, and that's a point of contact with God. Number two, we must release our faith at the point when hands are laid on us. There is a release that we must let go from ourselves. We must say that's, that's when, when we determine that from that time onwards, we translate from shall have to have received. And in the spirit, we believe we have it. We must believe that. There is a switch that turns on on our inside. It needs to be released. And number three, we have to continue to stir forth that which we release in laying our hands for it to become a permanent feature in our life. There are some scriptures on that which we can consider later, just quoting offhand on 2 Timothy chapter 1. When, when Paul had laid hands on Timothy, he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Stir up the gift that's in your life which you receive from laying on of my hand. If we don't have to stir up our gift, it's automatic. Why did Paul tell Timothy to stir up his gift? We have to exercise faith in what we have received. And these are the things that need to be released. We are looking here at the five reasons for the laying on our hands. Reason number one, for healing, and inside that teaching on healing, we can also see the concentration of God's power in the hands. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, looking at how Jesus began his ministry. Now remember when Jesus began his ministry, people still don't know him. Although the Gospel of John records some uh, miracles, about two miracles, that was the, the miracles, the early miracles that were done. But primarily, people have to get to know him. And as people get to know him, then people can have faith in the anointing to be released upon their lives. Like the woman with the issue of blood who says that if I touch him, I shall be made whole. There was a release. Other people were touching him, but they didn't, they, they, they didn't receive. But the woman's touch was different. There was faith in war. It takes time to build up what I call spiritual reputation. It takes time to build up faith in people's lives. In Mark chapter 1, Let's look at Gospel of Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Let's see how Jesus started his ministry in Mark chapter 1, verse 14. 
Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom of God. He went to Galilee and uh, verse 21, then they went into Capernaum. Jesus started his ministry in Capernaum. When you're new in your ministry and you're starting off, people still don't recognize the anointing of God on your life. You got to start where Jesus started. He built up the ministry in his life. Let me show how he built it up. There's one more cross lesson in Matthew chapter 3. I need to prove that Jesus started his ministry in Capernaum. Verse 13, Jesus came from Galilee to John, to the Jordan, to be baptized by him. Then in chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee, verse 13, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. Those of us familiar with the Bible realize that Capernaum was where Peter's house was. And Jesus probably spent his time at Peter's house in the early part of his ministry. He began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Let's cross-reference back to Mark 1 to see how his reputation grew. Verse 21, Mark 1, verse 21, they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine. Verse 23, there was a demon there. In verse 24, they, they say all kinds of things. Verse 25, he re Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. The unclean spirit came out and they were all amazed. Verse 28, immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. So people began to get to know him, his ministry. This was how he started. Verse 29, And as soon as they come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew, and James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came, took her by the hand, and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her, and she served them. Now at evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick, and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak, because they knew him. So there was a multitude there. Jesus did many uh, miracles when he was there in Peter's house. So much so that there was like a revival in that in that city of Capernaum on that day. Now here's the interesting thing that Luke, the physician, recorded. In the Gospel of Luke, cross-reference to the same story, but from a different angle. Luke chapter 4, verse 38 onwards, you found it in Luke chapter 4, verse 38. Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever, and they made requests of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and he left, and immediately she arose and served them. He combined the passages together. One talked about how he took her hand. So we realized we put the picture together. She took him as a held her hand, rebuked the fever and help her up. She was healed. And then came the people to the house, the door in verse 40. Now when the sun was setting, all those who were anyone sick with various diseases brought them to him. And look at the next sentence. Same verse, verse 40. And he laid his hand on every one of them and healed them. That's interesting. Sometimes Jesus Christ, in the Gospels, he doesn't need to lay hands. Sometimes as he walked, the people were trying to touch his garments. But here, as he began his ministry, he had to lay hands because the people's faith level was not built up yet. 
their faith level will not build up yet. They're slowly coming to see what he can do. And as he started, he laid hands on them one by one. There was a multitude that day. Think about how long it took. In the early days of the charismatic revival, all they knew was laying on our hands. Catherine Kuhlman was the one who began to operate in the word of knowledge and show them that it can be done in a different way. But otherwise, it was just long queues and long lines. They were one by one, all Roberts used to lay hands on hundreds at a time, take many hours to lay hands on many people, one by one. It's very hard for some of us to imagine Jesus did it. But he did it. Look the physician record that he laid hands on every one of them. Took many hours. Why laying on a hand? Why, why does it take that for Jesus to start? According to the faith level. In the book on the anointing, I shared about how the method is tailored sometimes to the degree of anointing manifesting. But let's cross reference to another incident in Mark chapter 6 where there was not, where there was no great faith. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus was back in his hometown and the people didn't accept him as a Messiah. They ridiculed him, they scorned. And among those things that were said are like Mark 6 verse 3, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Verse 5. Now he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people, and heal them. Do you notice that when the faith level of the people was almost zero and where very, very few people believed in him, Jesus went back to the laying on of hands. Why? Because it's in the hands where power is concentrated. Remember what we said earlier, that statement? God's power is concentrated in His hands. Now, God is so powerful. I mean, power is everywhere in His presence. But the concentration, the issuing forth where the power comes through His hands. We are made in the image of God. It is... The power of God in our lives can flow all over, even within our presence. In the book of Acts chapter 5, the presence of God was so mighty on Peter's life that his shadow passing by healed people. But yet at times when the faith level was not there, doubt, unbelief, etc. comes in, and faith level goes down, where can we always get the full release where the power is concentrated like the filament in a light bulb, the hands, are the concentration point of the power. So every time you're in a place where there's a lot of unbelief, where it's very hard to connect the power of God, you go back to the elementary principle of impartation by laying on our hands and you will still see the miracle of God. In fact, when we teach our ministers traveling, going out, and uh, sometimes when you're traveling evangelists and, and, and you need to make a breakthrough in the spirit realm, in some places people are more doubtful, some places people have more faith. Even in Jesus' life, you see, in the very next chapter, uh, the, the people have so much faith that when they hear about him, they were running to him and uh, just touching his garments with healing. Same Jesus but different reception. And we teach our ministers when they go out, see, people sometimes need to be built up slowly in their faith. Each meeting is different because people come with different expectations. And when it's a very, very hard meeting, what are you going to do? If you're the evangelist, there's a hard meeting. Everyone is staring, looking at you. One good can come out of 
in a bar <laughs> right, or, or something of the nature of they're looking at you. You need, you, you need to be able to pick up the real people who had the faith, a few stick folk, and if you could pick them up, connect with the power of God, and if you could succeed in bringing healing in that very same meeting, happens. One healing begins to break the barrier. So when people see one person heal in a meeting, their faith begins to rise up. They begin to, to release their unbelief, release their doubt. And after hearing three, four healings, and more and more taking place, that suddenly it looks like a deluge of the spirit. And what actually takes place was unbelief fled out the door. Doubt fled out the door. So we need to learn to use where the power is concentrated on. The laying on of hands. It's very powerful when we learn the doctrine of laying on our hands. In the book of Acts, Even though God worked mightily in many, many ways, yet the book of Acts records for us here uh, in uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, Many signs and wonders were done among the people. Many signs and wonders were done among the people. It, it's wonderful when, when you hear that. It's like if we were having a healing service and we're concentrating on, on bringing healing to people, a healing service, a, a miracle service and not a teaching seminar, we would probably, if we are, we are really wanting to release the, the, as much power of healing and miracles and signs and wonders as possible, we would possibly do what, what uh, many evangelists do. We, we would take uh, uh, people who have healings that were confirmed and they have remained healed for some time and they will come and open the meeting by sharing their testimony. And as they share the testimony, faith is built up. And as their faith is slowly built up, you can pick people who are ready for, to receive their healing. You can channel it through laying on their hands. And the faith begins to build up more and more. It's easier and easier to receive the miracles of God. I want you to know that operating in the power of God is like walking on water. The difference between a miracle and no miracle has to do with faith. The faith that operates in that meeting. If you're 10 seconds late, you don't get it. You have to be right on the dot. When the power is there, that's when you've got to release it. You've got to act out the faith. Not just acting, but you've got to act at the point of time when the power is greatest. And as you act, the healing takes place. So Acts 3, Peter pulled the man up. That releases the power of God. Like Acts 14, Paul commanded the man who has faith to stand up and he got his healing. It takes the acting part to release the power of God. But the power of God must be present. And all this building up is where we are learning the importance of laying on our hands. Acts 19. We read about a great revival in Ephesus. But I want you to know it started with a simple laying on of hands. Acts 19. Verse, verse 12 is wonderful. It says, So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. But don't forget verse 11, how it first started. Now God worked unusual miracles by the, what's that word? Say hands. By the hands of Paul. It started where the concentration of power is. And as faith is released, more the power of God is released. Number one, the laying on of hands is for healing. Sometimes when you're in a hospital, sometimes we are places where a lot of unbelief, doubt, and negative talk, etc. are there. When you feel it's hard to release, you go to the basic laying on of hands. It's very effective, powerful. 
laying on hands for the sick for healing. It's found in Mark 16, verse 17 and 18. In my name they shall cast out devil, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. It's in the Bible, and that's for every believer in God. In the second area for the laying on of hands, the second reason for the laying on of hands is found in the book of Acts chapter 8. It's to minister and impart, minister and impart the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Minister and impart the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Let's read Acts chapter 8, verse 14. For now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. I want to make it clear that that's not the only way to receive the baptism in the Spirit. In the book of Acts chapter 10 verse 46, as Peter was preaching, the Holy Spirit came on them. You can receive the baptism in the Spirit without the laying on of hands when you're in the atmosphere of God's people praising, worshipping God or listening to the Word. But where some people have difficulty getting it or releasing it. It always comes back to where the source of the power, where the concentration of the power is, is in the hands. And those laying on hands can transmit the baptism in the Holy Spirit in ways that you could never do in any other way, sometimes in a difficult case. And the laying on our hands will release such infusion of power that a person can begin speaking in tongues. Now, there was an observer there in Acts chapter 8. He was a fresh new convert from a life of uh, witchcraft and magic. In verse 18, his name was Simon. Now, when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in the matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this your wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. And verse 24, we realize Simon did repent, for he asked him to pray for him. So Simon is just a young Christian and uh, who just didn't know things better and said a few things wrong and did a few things wrong. Uh, we know he's born again for he has been baptized in water by Philip in Acts He was among the young believers. We want to make it very clear here that he was not asking for the Holy Spirit. He was asking for the power to impart the Holy Spirit. What he was impressed with was not just the Holy Spirit. If he wanted to receive the baptism in the Spirit, he would have come to Peter and John and said, lay hands on me. No, he wanted the power to lay hands and someone receive, and someone receive, and someone receive. He wanted that. No, he wanted the power to lay hands and someone receive, and someone receive, and someone receive. He wanted that. Because why he is a performer, his former life is a performer. Look at Acts 8. Before he was born again, it was nice. He was a practicing sorcery. He astonished the people. He claimed to be someone. He liked this choo 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 business. And he told Peter and John, he told Peter, uh, I give you money if you can pass over that choo. Looks interesting. And Peter rebuked him, saying, This is the gift of God, it cannot be bought with money. Now, there are certain things that we discover as we learn the five reasons why. Five reasons for laying on our hands. First reason for healing. To the, to the young believer, remember this. That means that laying on our hands transmits power. There's a transmission of power. 
that is available to the laying on of hands. In reason number two, where the baptism in the Spirit is imparted to the laying on of hands, you see an important side principle here. That there, there are some who have a gift of laying on of hands. Everybody can lay hands, but some have a gift of laying on our hands. That makes it very interesting. Howard Carter and his wife, Howard Carter is one of the first people who began to teach about the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the early Pentecostal revival. He was the main teacher who taught in that area. He learned all his truths in prison. And Howard Carter had a special gift. He had a gift of laying on a hand for people to receive the baptism in the Spirit. His wife had a different gift. She had a gift of the laying on her hand for people to receive healing. See, some people have an anointing in a special type of gifting. And they can operate on that gifting. Oral Roberts' gift is his hand. And he had to stay to it. That was his call. He had to lay hands on people in order for the gift to flow. His gift was through the laying on a hand for people to be healed. Kenneth Hagin during one of the phases of his ministry, as you go through different phases, your gifting and manifestation can differ. Met Jesus in a vision and Jesus put a finger in the palm of his hand and he said it burned like coals of fire. And when he... Uh, tonight as we share on this topic, some of you are going to have a different manifestation, but don't worry, just keep enjoying the presence of God. And now, uh, as... He was supposed to put one of his hands in the front of a person and one at the back. So when he was ministering during that phase, he had to pray for people this way. God is very specific. If he asks you to pray this way, you pray this way, cannot. That is called a gift. A gift limits a person to a certain anointing upon to function in that way. I know. Uh, Yet it, it requires faith. And it says, Jesus said, when you put your hands on a person, if you feel the fire jump from one hand to the other, then it's a demon. Cast the demon out. That was a gift of laying on our hands. William Braham had a different gift. Can I go near there? William Braham had a different gift. When B William Braham ministered, he would sometimes hold the right hand of a person. And uh, so when he holds the right hand of a person, he would be able to pick up the sicknesses that are in the person's body. He could sense it. Uh, when the anointing is strong, sometimes that happens too. And uh, usually when the anointing is operating, I can pick up sicknesses in a, in a crowd uh, through vision. That is the way it operates. Uh, sometimes, uh, once in a while, it's a different anointing, and uh, and and one of the things is uh, is when when you're holding a person's hand and you open yourself to the spirit of God, sometimes one of the ways is a gift or laying on hands is you could begin to sense a person's life, a person's spirit, even a person's physical ailment in their body. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, let's let's check this one. Praise the Lord. It makes you feel like a doctor. You know, a lot of doctors around here, but it's a bit different. You're holding hands, kind. And uh, uh, sometimes it makes you feel like the thing thing. You know, the thing thing, you feel your pulse. But we're not trying to feel anybody's pulse here or counting their heartbeat or anything or looking at their face or anything. We are just trying to sense in the spirit some, some things. And, and sometimes when the anointing has been there, uh, when you help a person, it feels if the person had a pain, it felt like that pain is on you. And that is a gift of the, of the Holy Spirit operating. And you could sense that, that pain. 
that's, that's an example of, of what the uh, a, a gift of the laying out hands can operate. So, laying out hands can become a gift. It can be a normal command every believer can do, but it can be a gift. What happens when it becomes a gift? When it becomes a gift, it becomes pattern fit. That your hands take on a special, a special area of God's power flowing. For Howard Carter, it was, it was for baptism in the Spirit. For his wife, it was for healing. For William Granham, it was for discerning of sicknesses and diseases. For uh, Kenneth Hagin, it was for discerning of demon powers. And, it, and there are more things in that area. But number two, as we see, the reason for laying on our hands is for imparting the baptism in the Spirit. But the side point that we learn in that truth is that there is a gift of laying on our hands. All believers can preach the gospel, share the gospel with somebody, but there's a gift of an evangelist who is specialized in preaching the gospel. Whatever they do, they always preach and win so. So there is a norm, there is a special gift then. And that was a gift that Simon was interested to receive. That was a gift that Simon was interested to receive. And uh, he wanted to pay money for that, for the ability to impart. And Peter called it a gift. He says, your money perish with you, this is the gift of God. God can impart. As I share this, it's for the benefit of some of you, because God puts His gifts in His body. And some of us are not operating in our gift because we're only seeing some, some types of gifts. We see the preacher, we see the evangelist operating in word of knowledge, we see the prophet, and we then realize there are these different, different types of, of gifts uh, of the, of the, of in the hands. And, and let me just describe a few experiences that I had that I began to learn about this gift. Uh, one of the things is, is when, 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 I, when I hold hands with a person, uh, if the person is wearing a charm, I would say away no. Cannot run away. Clean, right? Okay. <laughs> so, anyway. Let me describe the experience. <laughs> what it's like. Uh, when you see sometimes you experience first and you try to understand and until you understand the experience of what I call the manifestation you won't be able to operate it so one day when I was uh, ministering and I was laying hands on people and I was placing my hands upon their head hallelujah praise the Lord right. somebody in this area right here has a back ache now how it operates in my life is this uh, uh, well, that's another whole story. We'll tell you a different time, right? About this radio signal kind of thing. Let me, but I'll say to my subject, laying on hands, right? Uh, and one day I was laying hands on this person, and uh, I felt my whole hand numb. And it was not a, a paralyzing numb. It was not a... a uh, nothingness feeling numb. It was a painful numb. <laughs> what's this? What's, what's, what's on his hair? What, what's causing the numbness? Because I, I, my mind started analyzing. What's wrong? I didn't understand it. And uh, when I went back and asked God, God said that they are wearing, they are wearing charms. The demon powers that they are attracting into their lives. And so I learned, and the next time that feeling came, I said, Oh, oh, what do you have? And I remember when the person said, Oh, how do you know I have? The Lord told me. <laughs> yeah. but, but now you know how the Lord told me, right? <laughs> you had to learn that way. And it's interesting, we begin to explore in this area, and other experiences that, that I had uh, uh, was a different sensation. Now remember, we don't base theology on experience. Experience can change according to our personality and the way we are. So what it feels to me may not be what it feels to you. I'm only sharing it so that you will be open when the Spirit of God works in your life. And understand your experiences in God and operate the gift God has for you. 
The reason why God is sending me here to teach the word is to stir up the gifts in your life. And one of the experiences was when I was praying, and I was in a hospital, and I had this bitter taste in my mouth. And I didn't eat bitter cod that day. No. There was this bitter taste in my mouth. I didn't understand it for three months. I couldn't understand what it was. But when that person died, I began to associate the two together. God was telling me that there was a spirit of death hanging over the person. I didn't know, I didn't know what it was. Later on, it became the sensation which I got used to. Whenever I'm praying for people, in fact, uh, some years ago, uh, we prayed for this, uh, one of our elderly church members, uh, sister who was in India, and it was by proxy, we prayed and she was, she was like, a uh, very difficult sickness was going through, and prayed and God healed her. The second time, a few years later, she got a different problem, different sickness, and we prayed. The moment I started praying, oh, my whole mouth went bitter. By that time, I knew where it was. And I told her, I cannot pray. No matter how I try to pray, God seems to be telling me that death is inevitable. And she's a believer, she's going to go. And uh, this elderly sister just cried, she wept. And, um, but I thought she is gonna, she is gonna die. And uh, she's born again, she's safe anyway, and I think it's time for her to go. God does not permit me to do anything else. And she wept, and she just couldn't find her to accept, because she, she loved her and missed her. But a few months later, she, she died. And you know what it's like to be a pastor. You, you, you want to be with them, you want to comfort them. And so I kept, we I went to her and I said, God revealed it earlier so that now we can be comforted. It was something God told you is going to happen. And you should be comforted that God told you ahead and you had t- some time with her and, and, and you took all these things with, uh, expecting that it didn't happen, although a part of you just wished that it would not happen. These are some of the sensations that come uh, through laying on our hands and uh, there are many more things like that but I just opened that subject to, to show forth that there is a gift for the laying on our hands uh, some of you when you begin to minister you may have different sensations on your hands I began to understand what each one is sometimes there is like like something piercing your hand it's almost like like uh, a painful piercing, it's a different omitting from when sometimes you feel heat in your hand. These are all special, special types of the gifts of laying on our hand. That you've got to seek God and discover from God what the gift of laying on our hands is operating through your life. One of the many gifts of laying on our hands is for baptism in the Spirit. And it's also the second Bible reason for laying on our hands. Well, we've got to run to number three. Reason number three for laying on our hands. Uh, in case you need more scripture for laying on our hands for baptism in the Spirit, you can also put down Acts chapter 9 when Ananias laid hands on uh, Saul, who was physical Paul, and he received the... Uh, his scales dropped on his eyes and he received the, uh, the Holy Spirit. Because when Ananias came to him and said, Brother Saul, Jesus has appeared to me and sent me to you to lay hands on you and uh, that uh, you may receive the Holy Spirit. So that's Acts 9. Another case, another different case is Acts 19. When the 12 efficient disciples uh, were ministered to by Paul, they were rebaptized by Paul. Paul laid hands on them and they were all filled with the Spirit. So that's uh, two more scriptures that you could add to your collection. Third reason for laying on our hands is in Second Timothy chapter one. Second Timothy chapter one. 
Verse 6, Paul says to Timothy, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He says God has, has not given us a spirit of fear but of love, power and sound mind. He says stir up the gift that is in your life through the laying on of my hands. Paul's hands on Timothy. He recognized there was an impartation. An impartation. Of course, all laying on hands come from an impartation. But we want to put it as a separate third point because there is a principle that is in line with it. Laying on our hands for impartation is what I call the... Uh, a process by which we can catch or receive what is in another, another person's life. Not just for healing, not just for uh, operating a gift of God in their life, but sometimes when you see some people with some qualities, even if it be character, it can be infused, interestingly, to the laying of hands. Now, remember some things are caught, some things are taught. Don't get one-sided and everything is caught. So you don't read your Bible. You, you want love, go to someone, love it, pray for me. And uh, you want faith, go to someone, say, we say, pray for me. No, no, some things are, are taught, some things are caught. We must be balanced. It, laying on our hands is not a shortcut Christianity. When you don't do your homework, you want something, just come on, turn on the switch or turn on the hand. Some things are taught. We, we need to be balanced. Some Christians are all on one side. They think that everything they can get from Christian life has to be to teaching, 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 learning, learning, learning. And when it comes to prayer impartation, they never come. They never uh, receive it. They never go to the laying on hands or association, etc. They just want teaching, teaching, teaching. You can get some things that way, but you will miss out a whole lot of things. And some Christians, they are too lazy to do their homework and it's not as hardworking as the other folks here. And all they want is shortcut, shortcut. They, they do receive something, but they miss out on a lot of things on that side. We need to be balanced. Some things are taught, some things are caught. When, in the book, Laying on Our Hands by Noah Hayes, Noah Hayes was with Lester Samuel. And, uh, and every time he was with no Lester Samuel, Noah Hayes is a businessman and he's called to be a teacher. Lester Samuel is a pastor in uh, South Bend, Indiana. And when Noah has was staying with him, no, uh, Lester Samuel has three, I think, uh, I think several children. And then he would get his three children, I think it was three children, and every time Noah uh, his come, comes around, Lester Samuel would say, uh, Brother Noah, would you lay hands on my children? And uh, he would lay hands on them. He said this is written in his book. And uh, then after that, last time they came, Brother Noah, would you lay hands on my children? And then again. And uh, in this time, Brother Noah, <laughs> would you lay hands on my son? And yes, yes, and lay hands. And uh, in the evening before going, uh, before going to sleep, uh, that's what someone said, Noah Hayes, could you come and lay hands on my son? <laughs> In the end, Noah Hayes says he felt embarrassed. I mean, everyone was probably here of Lester Samuel, he's a big man of God. And he his son, he said, he was embarrassed until he had to ask. So he asked, Lester Samuel, why do you only lay hands so many times on your son? And Lester Samuel, I'm sure you know the story of Lester Samuel. Lester Samuel followed Howard Carter. They connect one to another. He was a young boy when he followed him and he learned a lot of things from Howard Carter. And Lester said, No, I like your spirit. And I want your same spirit, small n, to be on my children. He was a man who made business with God. Don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left. Follow God. And 
Lester Summers' children never ever went astray. Not like a lot of uh, some some preachers who neglected their kids and and the kids all went astray. I was with Don Gossett and Don Gossett was sharing with me the agonizing story of how he was the one who was trying to bring back T.L. Osborne's son. And he used to take, because the T.L. Osborne and Daisy used to travel so much and it was also wrong in a sense, that was a neglect. Until uh, their, their son really grew up without, without the, the mom and dad. And the son uh, used to stay with Don Gossett. Don Gossett was assisting T.L. Osborne. And uh, in the end, the son became very wayward. And his heart was broken and the son died. Mm-hmm. He turned away from the lawn and got into the wrong crowd and he died in an accident. How I wish that that truth has been known. And perhaps someone who is steady and steadfast would come and lay hands over and over again and impart that character, that spirit of Christ. See, for many of you whose marriages are having a difficult time, when you find somebody else whose marriage lasted 25 years or 50 years, and they're born again Christian, go to them and ask them to bless your marriage. Something is imparted. Some of this character of Christ, some of this infusion uh, it, it sounds very in, uh, funny, but this is like what I call spiritual father's uh, spiritual son impartation. In the natural, there are natural impartations. And uh, it, has, it is through uh, procreation, and uh, all children receive a set, uh, some of their genes from the father, some from the mother. And it's a combination. The physical body looks a resemblance of either one of them. Spiritually, there's an impartation, but it's in the spirit realm. And the channel for it is to lay on our hands. And whenever I found a good minister, and some of my friends are ALD who worked many years with John Austin, he's such an elderly man, his marriage has lasted, I believe, nearly 40 or 50 years. And I remember asking him, could you lay hands on me and my wife so that, so that when, when uh, we are your age, uh, uh, our marriage will still be strong in the Lord. See, laying our hands is such an important thing to learn. And when we learn the positive side, some people have questions in their mind. Then what happens if a person with a broken marriage laying hands and someone with a good marriage? <laughs> we break. There is a quality, what I call, of closing up your spirit. It's the truth that we all must learn. Closing up our spirit. Now, there are even people who, who go out to say there's a transference of spirit. Don't let anybody suddenly lay hands on you because they can transfer a wrong spirit on you, etc. I like to make it balanced by making this statement. Our blood vessels, our blood flows through our body one way. Your blood don't flow two ways. One way through the, through the arteries and then back through the veins. Then the next day to the winds and back to the artery, confusion, <laughs> you die. Our blood flows in one direction. It takes the blood from the heart to the organs and tissues and brings it back to the vein. Why? Because there is a valve. There are valves that prevent a back flow. Spiritually, there are spiritual valves. So don't be afraid. Don't get some funny preacher who put fear into your life and say, Don't say, be there. If you lay hands on somebody, the demon will go through your hand and go to you. <laughs> Reverse. <laughs> and when someone is demon possessed, don't lay hands on them. Because if you're not strong enough, the demon will go to your hand and go to you. <laughs> Reverse. No. If our blood vessels have vows, how much more spiritual vows that is a one way? The current flows this way. Hallelujah. It's a one way stream. <laughs> and there, there is a block in which it cannot flow back. So don't ever be afraid of laying on the hands of people. You won't catch a demon. No way. You won't catch something coming back on you. That's a wrong teaching. We don't, there's no scripture for that. And people who use scriptures for what I call association, that's different. 
the who and who is like his father and who and who are the weaknesses that's more of what you call association to the soul not to laying on a hand so don't be afraid uh, a believer can lay hands any believer you don't have to be a five-foot minister or pastor can lay hands on the sick however if you are the one who is having hands laid on somebody else laying on hands on you you need to learn how to close your spirit if you don't want it there is something on our inside how to close our spirit by making a firm decision saying no I'm not receiving it automatically the switch is turned off and all that will come on you is just a human hand that's all there will be no flow there is an internal switch that we learn to turn off when uh, people try to uh, lay hands uh, on you to impart something I had a very strange uh, uh, experience when I was in my uh, second year uh, in the seminary I was doing my field work in Kanga Perlis we used to travel about uh, three hours up by bus and we were a group of these people in Perlis Baptist Church and I get all the young people who are hungry for God and we pray one night when we were praying about five or six of us this sister started saying visions all kinds of visions this and that and this and it, it sounded quite okay and then we were all listening to all the visions that she was talking about you know, interesting thing seeing this and then you know, interesting thing and then after she said then we pray some more we pray some more she sees some more we pray some more she sees some more sounds interesting and then one by one we came to the center of the circle and, and have the uh, has a prayer made for us and uh, for some reason when, when I and another brother were in the center uh, this sister they supposed to lay hands and pray but this sister couldn't lay hands on us she said something blocked her but then there was another sister who came to the center and this sister lay hands on that sister and that sister started seeing vision same thing she started seeing the same thing and all this after about one hour of that I was feeling uneasy in my spirit I'm not sure whether this is right or not I feel that this is not really the Holy Spirit it seems to be something else remember that time I was just a Baptist I, don't, I haven't known a lot of the things of the Pentecostal realm or demonology and in the end I began to realize I think it's demonic but the interesting thing was the demon transferred the ability to that girl to the lame of him thank God she couldn't lay hands on me hallelujah for some reason I don't know it must have been God protecting our ignorance <laughs> she said when she tried to lay hands her hands couldn't reach something blocked her but this sister her hands reached contact she got it wrong spirit wrong false spirit of prophecy when we realize that we say in the name of Jesus and there was a like a wind shoom, the spirits left and these two girls fell down and then got up and they were okay wow there was some experience but I made this observation that I never forgot this demon transferred to impartation hands that is why in some occultic fringe groups who claim not to be religious like the uh, what is this group of people uh, the guild uh, the whole uh, Freemason and all that there is some sort of transference that takes place in their so called secret ceremony and we need to learn how to close our spirit now when we are laying on hands on somebody else it can never flow backwards however when people are laying hands on you that is where you got to close so that is where the possible transference can take place because it's flowing this way and we need to learn how to close our spirit up there is an impartation remember the truth work both ways when it works in a positive realm, it works in a negative realm. You can impart 
the wrong thing. Which is why many times when you find uh, a leader who has something wrong in their life, not repented. Now leaders in God uh, have to strive for perfection, but we are all still on the way to perfection and we need to have our lives under the blood. We need to have no unconfessing in our lives. But when a leader sins and a leader uh, lives in secret sin or open sin or whatever, they, they, they become an open uh, channel for the enemy to work. And many times you see what the leader goes through, the other followers also go through. If there's broken marriage there, you find there's a whole group of broken marriages there. And the people are fighting to keep their marriages together wondering what went wrong because their leaders are not walking the Christ line. And through association and through other ways, and they, 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 they are allowing an open door for their people to be attacked. We need to be on our guard as leaders. Remember as leaders, your sin and your fall is not only your sin and your fall anymore. It is also the fall and sin, sadly, of many other people too. So leaders have a responsibility in God to live holy and righteous lives. Paul, in Romans chapter 1, understood this truth of impartation and came to, in this letter to the Romans, writing in at once to them, says in Romans 1, verse 11, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. Paul says, I long to see you to impart gifts into your life. That certainly doesn't sound like a, norm, uh, like a modern preacher. That's a, we have not taught all these things. But yet, there is Paul saying that he understood. It's just a simple basic principle of being able to come, lay hands and transmit things. We have learned a third point here. The first area, laying on hands for healing. The side principle that laying on our hands transmits power. Second point, laying our hands in part of baptism in the Spirit. The side principle is laying our hands is a gift. The third principle, laying on our hands for impartation. The side principle is that the laying on our hands transmits a person's life force into you. Not just the Holy Spirit, but the person's development of their spirit, their character can be transmitted into your life. Of course, that takes place by association, but that is even more powerful when the laying of hands takes place. So, understand this secret. You see, that's why the Bible put it as elementary principle. These are principles that help us to grow. If some of you have children who are uh, maybe difficult to handle, not so prayerful, you know what? Every time a man of God comes to town who spends eight hours praying, come, 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 come. Bring your towel. Let's sing, let's sing, the hands. And once in a while, you know, you're going to lunch with a person, hey, one more time, the hands. <laughs> I challenge you that if you do that, to see whether there is a difference. For children, you can see the result faster. Why? Children are like wet cement, wide open to any impression. They're just wide open to receive anything. And, and you could almost see an, an instant difference in your life. And for some reason, you know, suddenly your child, as they grow up, love to pray. Why did pray, spirit, prayer, spirit of prayer come upon your life? And they desire. If your child, don't, don't, uh, your child loves to play this video game, <laughs> spend eight hours all, all time, find somebody who doesn't quite like the game. <laughs> who instead of playing this video game would love to sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs. <laughs> Get their hands laid. Hallelujah. <laughs> of course, it works only when the spirit is open. And uh, there's a, an open and receptivity. But it works. It's one of the, the causes of spiritual growth. And sometimes some parents struggle. They teach and teach and teach. They remind and remind and remind. And they bring the child, drag the child to church all the time. All kinds of teaching. Nothing gets through. Why? Some things are taught. Some things are caught. 
and they need to catch them. Hallelujah. Let him catch that spirit. And we have seen it many, many times. A, a child who is, who is wayward and, and rebellious and has more laying hands. Every time you see the child, come, now lay hands on you. Say, oh yes, come, lay hands on you. Come, lay hands on you. Right? Praise the Lord. And lay hands to the bota. <laughs> but <laughs> lay hands huh? lay hands on them no no that won't happen man. that won't happen and something will begin to break in that child something will begin to break and as we hear this truth we say why didn't we think about it before that's what the bible call it the elementary principles these elementary principles are to supposed to be ways that speed up our spiritual growth in God once we learn how to use them. That's a powerful key. It transmits a person's spirit. The spirit of that person affecting the spirit of, of bringing, bringing the good things of a person's spirit into another, one life into another life. And we want the best in God. Every time a good character, a good man of God come, we will bring our children to come, lay hands, learn the secret, and don't miss out on that. It's powerful, life changing. And all of us who are growing and all of us who are children also know that for many teenagers and young children, it is more the subconscious that is greater influence than the actual conscious. Nobody gets into drugs just like that. It's by friends and association. You need to realize how powerful the laying on of hands is in impartation. Principle number four. Laying on our hands is for blessing. But before we look at the laying on our hands, I want to show forth in the Gospel of Luke 24 that Jesus Christ himself blesses. We know that he blessed children. And that's not the section we are looking at. Luke chapter 24. I'm sure you all know the story of how Jesus, uh, the, many people brought children to Jesus for him to bless the children. Why bless them? One transference. That's why I put it as point four. Of course, normal prayer is all called blessing. I right? don't get you confused. But there is one blessing with capital B. And that capital B blessing is usually given at the end of the road of somebody. Of course, normal prayer is all called blessing. I right? don't get you confused. But there is one blessing with capital B. And that capital B blessing is usually given at the end of the road of somebody. Like with the last breath, they give that blessing. But of course, for Jesus, it is still very powerful. Some people's last breath is, I, I, I bless, and say, hey, don't do that, bless. They go home. Thank God Jesus is not that way. Luke chapter 24, verse 15. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And what was Jesus doing? That was the last time they were going to see Jesus. With the exception of causing his appearances to vision. But Jesus was not going to be with them anymore. That was his finale. The final salutation and blessing. And as Jesus went out, he blessed them. He lifted his hand. He lifted his hand to each of them. Hands are where the source of the power. And he blessed them. Now there's something about that power of the blessing. We don't have time to look into that, but for greater interest, for those who want to study that, do you know when they, whenever the Israelites were to go to war, or when they were to, when they, when the cloud was about to move, when they pick up their tent to move, 
The Lord gives specific instructions on what the priest is to say. The priest must bless the people and make a declaration. The Lord bless you, etc., etc. The Lord will say sign on you. See, God knows the power of the blessing. But let's see something that took place through the laying of hands. In the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis, chapter 27, Jacob was old and he was, he, he wanted to impart the blessing. Chapter 27, Genesis, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his, Jacob, Isaac, oh yes, is Isaac. Jacob was young. Isaac was old, Jacob was young. And his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Esau his older son and said to him, My son, and he answered him, Here I am. Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. In other words, he was getting ready to die. And he said, Please, Take your weapons, your quiver, your, your bow, go out to the field and hunt game for me. Wait for that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Rebecca heard that and planned with Jacob to take the blessing. When the blessing was given, this is the most amazing as to the modern mind. It could not be. Neither could it be repeated. When Jacob had stolen the blessing and he was out the door, then came Esau. And let's look at chapter 27. There must be something different about this blessing for the normal prayer, what we call blessing. This is a blessing with capital B. Verse 30. It happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. And the blessing was there in uh, verse uh, 27 and to 29. The blessing was all those words, surely the smell of my son is my smell of peace, etc. Verse 29, he shall be master over your brethren, etc. Esau came in with the food and Isaac in verse 33 trembled. Who? Where is the one who hunted game? I think in verse 30, 33 I have blessed him and in this he shall be blessed. Verse 35 Your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. There was no way it could be undone. How powerful it was. Verse 36. Uh, Esau said, have you, have you not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac said, in verse 37, I made him your master. And all his brethren are given to him as servants. With grain and wine I sustain him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing? We have capital B. Bless me, bless me, bless me. Join the blessing club. Bless me, little girl, bless my wife, bless my daughter, bless my son, bless my dog, bless my cat. Curse the mind. <laughs> Bless me, club. <laughs> Verse 39. Then Isaac his father answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live and you shall serve your brother. He said, Come to pass and you become restless, then that you shall break his yoke from your neck. That's all you could give him. But it was really not much of a blessing. They became later the evil mind. A people, but not as great as Jacob, who later was Israel. The people of Israel became a blessed people. Just 
one blessing. It was a blessing with a capital B, the power of the blessing. Of course, when you pray for someone in a sense, generally it's also called blessing. When you dedicate to her, it's also blessing, all this. But there's one blessing, a capital B, which is the fourth point we're talking about. And this blessing is different. The transfer is in a different realm. This capital B blessing is like leaving the inheritance behind. When people die, they go home to be with the Lord. They leave physical inheritance behind for those who did plan their lives and leave something behind. The question we ask ourselves, if you could leave behind physical inheritance to our loved ones and to our children, is it possible to leave behind spiritual blessings? The answer tonight is yes. And I wish more Christians learn this truth because there are many spiritual inheritance that have not been transferred. What happens when someone dies without a will? As a pastor, we have to thought of some of those things before. It takes time to try to sort it out. The government has a, has a Legal law, well, how it is to be sorted out among all the relatives of the of the deceased, uh, I mean, all the family of the deceased. It doesn't automatically go to their their family. It goes to their brothers and their sisters, etc. Because they die without a will. What happens if there's nobody that can take it after a certain time? They work into common property. And a lot of spiritual blessings are not being transferred. You see, what, what happens if some of you are worried? You mean I leave all my spiritual inheritance behind? Then I go to heaven, what do I have? For so one thing you have, your mansions in heaven. <laughs> Don't worry. All we have Thinking about is a lot of these things that you build up in your life, in your spiritual realm, are not for you out there. Like, for example, authority over demons. Heaven is really need those things out there, there are no demons. And there's a whole realm out there. Or, or, or things that God has built into our lives. Something like Elijah, Elijah transference. Elijah had twice the portion. See, in the blessing, it can even multiply. But it was the same spirit. Read carefully. Elijah did everything Elijah did. And you read the portion of the story, second verse 3, it was the spirit small s of Elijah. There was a spiritual inheritance. <clears throat> you know, it's that time to look into that. But you check it out in the, in the book of Zah, etc. You find it talk about the inheritance of heaven transfer is talking about leaving our children, leaving a spiritual inheritance for them. The fact is, how do we transfer it to them? Through the laying on of hands in blessing. I wish that some of the older ministers of God or, or, or devout men, the women of God, before they go off, I wish two things. I wish that they had learned how to transfer their spiritual inheritance to somebody, and I wish that they had somebody to transfer it to. Then the body of Christ will move from glory to glory. What happens when they fail to be transferred? Somebody has to start all over again. All the inheritance uh, things are gone, they're going to get it all over again. But transference is a powerful process to the power of the blessing. And Jacob, when he was old, he knew how important the power of blessing is. But not everybody in the Bible did it, do you realize that? But those who it affected knew the importance and they continued to infect it. Jacob knew because his whole life was built around the blessing. 
Later, before, when, before he died, when he was old, in the book of Genesis, chapter 47, 48, that's right. Genesis 48. Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, came with Joseph to see their grandfather before Jacob died. Verse 8. Then Israel saw Joseph's son and said, Who are these? They are my sons, and God has given me in this place. And he said, Please bring them to me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim, so he could not see. Joseph brought them near, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face. But in fact, God has also shown me your offspring. So Joseph brought them from beside his knees and he bowed down with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both Ephraim with his right hand to Israel's life and Manasseh with his left hand. Ephraim was the elder child. Manasseh was the younger. So he put Ephraim on the right hand of, of Jacob and Manasseh, the younger, on his left hand. But you know what Jacob did? Jacob crossed his hands. And because the the child Manasseh received the greater blessing, Manasseh became a bigger tribe than Ephraim. You can read about it in the book of Joshua. When they divide the, the, the Lord, the tribe of Manasseh was one of the one of the largest tribes. All because one man who believes in the power of blessing learned to transfer that blessing in a powerful way into his right hand into Manasseh. Isn't it marvelous to see that because of that Ephraim which, which and Manasseh which are actually not not the sons of Jacob, they were grandsons of Jacob. They rise up to become the tribes of Israel. All the other tribes of Israel were sons. They were actually grandsons. But the blessing was powerful. And so the next time you hear a man of God about to move, hallelujah, if everybody has been teaching in under a long time, there can be a transference that takes place. And it also depends on the receiving and the preparation that, that is necessary to receive. Elijah served for 10 years before he was transferred. He literally had the inheritance, literally, of Elijah. He had a mentor. He wrote a mentor. They said, where is the God of Elijah? <laughs> the same thing happened. When he came, everybody said, this is second Elijah. Twice as powerful. He did everything he did. Why? Because there was a, an inheritance transfer. If you learn this secret, the body of Christ will be a much powerful group of people. Think about the many blessings we have lost. It can be many, many ways. Sometimes one of my elders, and, uh, and uh, he is uh, now in uh, uh, LA with his daughter, and he's now based there. He's a man of prayer. When he prays, he gives a gift of tears that's going up of his He is like a, like a prayer high. You heard of his own high. He's someone like that. And uh, every time I visit him, I would get my children. My hand. When he looks up to me spiritually, you know, everything he looks up to me. But there's something he has set on in his life that I want my children to have. So that my children will have that contrite in their life. We need to understand the power of blessing capital with a capital B and learn how to receive and draw on that. And I know that. There are sometimes men of God. Uh, uh, sometimes after Agong Bangau came to visit us, 
uh, I encourage a lot of my church people, I say, look, if you really want to learn from that man and be a call to prophetic ministry, you better go and visit or stay there for some time and learn from his life. Some of them do do that, do do that in the process. And they obeyed God to go and sit under the ministry. And when he went home to be with the Lord, some of them regretted. Because one of them came and said, God told me to go and I didn't go. And then I encouraged some of them in the prophetic office. I said, look, he has stepped into a prophetic realm. And, and we must continue in what he has stepped on. And the sad thing is because people don't understand truth like that. They don't understand how to get that transfer to them. So that the man and the vessel can go. Moses can go. Elijah can go. Peter can go. Paul can go. But the same spirit can still stay in one to a different vessel. You must understand that powerful change that can take place. Praise God. The last and final reason for transferring, as they say, the first reason for healing, laying on hands transmit power. Second reason for laying on hands is impartation or for uh, receiving the baptism in the spirit. Quite principle, the gift of laying on our hands, there is a gift thing. Third principle, laying on our hands for impartation, third principle, transference of life. Person's life transferred into you all in some way. Now, when we say transfer, please don't think about one life disappearing goes to the other life. Life multiplies. Just like Jesus' life is multiplied in our life. All of us are followers of Jesus. All of us want to be like Jesus. Billions of us. So in the spirit, things can multiply. Like Paul said, be imitators of, of him as he imitated Christ. Now, fourth, the power of the blessing. Laying on our hands for blessing, the capital B, is by principle, transference of spiritual inheritance. Spiritual inheritance needs to be claimed. Of course, the best people to claim them are the spiritual children. So that's why it's not like a stranger. And then suddenly God gave me a revelation, Kenneth again is going to go home to visit the Lord. You quickly go. I can't wait to put off it away. I don't know. The best transference are his spiritual children. But these principles are vitally important. We must have those principles for you to transfer. Just say, like, even today, many, many people live their life like this uh, without a will. I tell my, my members of my church, if you are over 40, you should have a will. I mean, like having a will doesn't mean you're going to go home. That you're signing your last testament, like you're going to die. No. Being a will is just a responsible way of organization, just like you organize your accounts, you're going to organize it. All these things are just organized. And I, I told them that because one day one of my members, many years ago, he, 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 he died, just suddenly without a wish, and for two years we had to sort out the thing. We had to see the law, I, I had to go to see the law, on his behalf, they had to walk more work with the pastor to, to make sure that all that he had was transferred to his, his brother uh, and his, and his uh, uh, wife in India, and uh, they wrote to me, they wrote, and the amount of work was that much the legal paper. All because there was no legal will. So remember, you save the pastor work when you go home in the wheel. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I just, just trying to make my work easier as so. well. <laughs> but it's a whole lot of hassle. And uh, anyway, I don't know really my life. I just have it and just, you know, it's a simple one. And it's fine enough. In case one day I went with God and disappeared. <laughs> then the, the whoever I left behind has still the only responsibility. At least there, is, there are no problems of legal transfer if you have any property. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult for them. So this is all what I call responsible. Being responsible. It doesn't mean that you're ready to go home. I'm going to leave until Jesus comes. 
call the translator earlier. But we have to be responsible in all these things. There's just a tight line, right, for some of you who are putting or writing a real thing, writing a real in the Asian concept and he's going to die. Praise the Lord. Right, after than making the work here easier. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now we have here the fifth and last reason for the laying on of hands, which is a very important one. Let's look at the book of First Timothy chapter five. First Timothy chapter five. <laughs> and here is one of the most misunderstood scriptures in verse twenty two. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor say in other people's things, keep yourself pure. Now, a lot of people have taken that verse, put it out of context, and say, look, look, the Bible says don't simply lay hands, and uh, in case you get your destiny or the demon on your life. They have taken the Bible out of context. They think that laying on their hands is only for healing and casting out devils. There are five reasons for laying on our hands. This is nothing to do with reason number one, reason number two, reason number three, reason number four. The context has to do with reason number five, which is the laying on a hand to ordain a person into an office, a spiritual office. Look at the context. The context show interpretation. This word is it's talking about spiritual leadership, elders who rule well, and people who are responsible. And uh, and he charged everyone to observe these things. And then he says, do not lay hands on anyone hastily. He's talking about do not hastily appoint someone into a position of authority. Do not ordain people too fast. Let them prove themselves. Why? Because when you ordain them and they fall, you are also responsible for the sin that takes place and the damage that takes place. That's what he's talking about. Paul left Timothy behind to, to entrust things to faithful men, to appoint faithful men with, with given things to do. So he had a reason. He was like an overall in charge of them. He was going to appoint people. And Paul warned him, even though you teach and you, and you help them, you guide them, do not lay hands in the sense of laying on a hand to ordain them into an office hastily. That's reason number five for laying on a hand. It's for ordaining a person into something which God has for their lives. It is a very important thing to do, even though you may know your call, even though you, you, you may have a, a gift operating in your life, the ordination process, if it's done properly, spiritually, not just as a tradition. See, there are a lot of traditions we inherit, and we think it's just symbolic. We forget that there's a release of spiritual power behind it. In fact, John Wesley, if you read his life story, even though he was ordained by one of the uh, bishops of the Church of England in his time, and everything was very traditional, Yet he really prepared himself. And in his biography, he said how when, when he was ordained, he felt something on his inside taking place. So there is some power relief in the ordination process. In the book of Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 6, verse 6, whom they sat before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Now here's the different reason for laying on our hands. It's to set these people into an office that God has called them to. Here is the office of a deacon. Immediately when that took place in verse 8, Stephen and also Philip, who later grew into an evangelist, their ministry exploded. And here's the side principle number five. See, there are five reasons for laying on our hands and there are five uh, side principles that relate to those two. The side reason here is that the ordination process, laying on our hands for ordination, side principle here is laying on our hands because of spiritual explosion of power 
to enter the office God calls you to. It releases the, the gift and the office that God has on your life. In the book of Acts, chapter 13, the Holy Spirit confirmed in their prayer meeting that Paul and Barnabas were called to be to special ministry. They know they were called. Paul, Paul had that word delivered to him in Acts chapter 9. He knew he was called to, a, <coughs> to that special office <coughs> of an apostle, a missionary. But yet, as they are praying together in verse 2, the Holy Spirit said separate to me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. <clears throat> now, it looks like they, they can just go in and do the job. But look, in verse 3, having fasted and prayed. <clears throat> in other words, they prepare themselves, they laid hands on them, and they sent them away. There is a greater relief in a person's ministry. I watch some people, after they are doing the ministry, just explode. It takes off in a higher dimension. It's like a launching pad spiritually for the office God has for them. In Acts 14, when, when Paul, in his first missionary journey, has completed his work, it says in verse 23, So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in, in whom they believed. They still laid hands on them after uh, and appointed them. The word appoint implies a process of laying on of hands. This is appointment, an ordination process, a recognition given to someone who has a specific call in their lives. We need to learn the secret of ordination and if the timing has to be right, it cannot be done hastily. When all things are correct and people prepare themselves and that process takes place, there is a powerful explosion in the spirit realm. We need to learn the secret of ordination and if the timing has to be right, it cannot be done hastily. When all things are correct and people prepare themselves and that process takes place, there is a powerful explosion in the spirit realm. If you read the book by Kenneth Hagin, I believe in Visions, his biography, in one of them, Jesus appeared to him and told him about the gift of healing that was going to operate in his life. And Jesus said this word, From now on, when the demons see you, they will recognize you. If you don't believe, you can check that book, I believe in Visions by Kenneth Hagin. Now here's an interesting point. There is a recognition in the spirit realm. A spiritual ordination brings that about. What actually took place in Hagin's life? There was something that, that Jesus ordained into his life. If you read his, his book carefully, Jesus uh, anointed his hands and talked to him, etc. At the end of it, he knelt down and Jesus laid hands on him to send him. There is a realm out there in the spirit. See, a lot of Christians, when they cast out demons, they say, Jesus, come out. Demons just look at them. Come out. <laughs> demons don't know them. You say, Pastor, you mean the demons know us? Yes, Acts chapter 19. The seven sons of Siva. They say, come out in the, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preached. The demons said, Jesus we know, Paul we know, Siapa <laughs> Tau. Huh? Who are you? And uh, the demon attacked them. It's interesting to note that the demons knew Paul. When Jesus Christ came from the temptation of the wilderness, as he, as he entered the synagogue, the demons recognize him and scream. There is such a transference that takes place in the, in the spirit realm 
when what I call there is a spiritual recognition upon our life, an explosion so great. The ordination, to many of us who just see the physical realm, we only think in terms of recognition by man. Visible. We forgot it's also a spiritual recognition by God and a spiritual announcement to the devil. So that the, the devil's kingdom gets shaken. You know the devil is also observing what takes place in the, in the kingdom of God with fear and trembling, wondering what's going to take place next. And sometimes we think we are alone, we are not. We, the church in the book of Ephesians, are bearing witness not only to the people in the world, but to the demon power, we become a manifestation of God's love and God's mercy and grace on our lives. God is showing His grace through the church to all the, the world, spirit, spiritual world and the natural world around. When David fell into sin with Bathsheba, you know what God told, told him? God said that he has made God's enemies, allow God's enemies to mock at God. But nobody saw it. The devil saw it. The devil was the one who, planned, who, who sort of orchestrated the whole situation, making sure that, that at the very time that David was a bit lazy, doing nothing, strolling about when he should be fighting out the war, making sure that Bathsheba was there, her name was Bathsheba because she loved to bathe, bathe, she bathe, right? And she was bathing in public, in uh, not really public, or rather in the court of her house. And we all know the, the story. But the remarkable thing was that God said, that David has given an occasion for God's enemies to mock at God. But nobody knew. Nobody physical knew. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 14. However, because by this deed, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. I don't see anybody doing that during that time of David. I don't see any human beings doing that. In fact, the judgment that he had came many years later. We know because it took some time for uh, his son Absalom to go on exile then come back for a while and then only uh, have an uh, insurrection against him. That was many years. But here, right on that time, the devil and demon powers were blaspheming and mocking God. Oh, man of God, serve God with fear and trembling. When you're all alone, you're not alone. I, you are making an impact in the spirit world by your life, by your prayer. Even if nobody sees it, the demons recognize you. So do they? Yes. It takes only one man or one woman dedicated to the Lord to change the world. It may not change the world immediately, but it takes just one life, I want you to know. You notice Daniel was only one man. But that one man who loved God and was called the beloved of God, who gave his life for God, in his private closet he was praying and fasting. And yet what he did affect the entire nation of Israel. All it takes is one man. In the secret place is where the battle is. When you fall into sin, secretly, you don't fall alone. There are angels watching. There is God watching. There are demons mocking. See, a lot of us are living our lives just for people. And we are good when people are around us. 
And when the people who are preventing us from sinning because of their influence and what we don't want them to think of what we are, we don't sin, we become stronger. But when we are all alone, we begin to do all the wrong things. I want you to know there are demons watching you, demons tempting you, looking for occasion to mock and blaspheme our Father God. To mock at Jesus. Whether you're in a crowd or you're alone, live your life the same way. Righteous and holy before God. Now part of the reason number five for laying on our hands is for ordination is that ordination is a giving of spiritual recognition not only in the physical world but in the spiritual realm. And it causes an explosion so great that demons recognize something there and acknowledge something has taken place. That's why if it's done right, it's important. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we just come before you, Lord. And we ask, so oh God, that you cause our, your, our heart to grow in you, our heart to be ministered to you. Even as we come into your very presence, oh God. Lord, tonight is a special night, Lord, for laying on our hands. Father, we pray that you come into our hearts and our lives, oh God, in a fresh revelation upon us, oh God. Father, that we need not leave this place without receiving that which you have for our lives. You have something special for us, Lord. Something, Lord, that is in line with this word that you're bringing forth. The seal upon our lives. Thank you, Father God. We worship you, Lord. Tonight, as we come before God, let's all rise together and sing softly that song. Thou the porter, I am the clay. O him, move me and make me turn. I have thine own way, right? That's the hymn. And as we sing that song, uh, I like uh, five pastors that, or, or leaders to help me. Uh, uh, Pastor William Wuhan and uh, Dr. Philip and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and two more other pastors or leaders to come. Five of you, could you come right up? Yeah. going to pray tonight for different things. I don't know. We're going to pray for healing. All through laying on hands tonight, healing, baptism in the spirit, gifting, especially in the area of laying on hands, impartation, and uh, spiritual explosion in your life in areas of gifts that God has for your life and each is in different areas here now as these ministers stand here they are not standing on their own anointing they are standing here based on anointing in this place and they are flowing under our direction so it's not just them it's the Holy Spirit working through so if you want the healing, you go right to the end. Baptism in the Spirit, the second here. Uh, gifts are laying on your hands. You've got some areas in your life where there are, there are manifestations in your hands. And you may not quite fully understand whatever it is. Just come and have that hands laid on you. And may God teach you what it is. 
areas of impartation that God will reveal more and more tonight to you in your life in that area. What we are praying tonight, especially in number three, four, and five here, is not the actual impartation of His life into your life in the sense of uh, impartation because as we have thought, it depends on life that we see. But it's in the area of understanding and quickening in the area, especially that God will impart it into you. And what you're receiving here through also is uh, an impartation of my life here. Through the leaders here to you. And I'm going to pray a while in the Spirit. And we're going to pray. And we ask each one of you who are here to lift up your hands to God right now. And we're going to ask God to give specific anointings in your life for them. And a pastor here is going to pray for that. Maybe you have not been recognized in some gifts or areas. We're not officially ordaining you. That can only be done in your own local fellowship, your own church. But what we are doing here is praying for that spiritual explosion to take place in your life. That recognition that can take place. See, Paul was sent forth by the church, but he was also prayed for in that prayer meeting. That's what we're doing in this meeting in line with the word, that spiritual explosion. Let's all reach out to God and yield to God even now to see something. Let God have His way.
there are different people who need healing. There is a, a man with an uh, uh, elbow problem and uh, a sister with an ankle problem wearing a, a yellowish green dress. A different areas of healing. You come to this area here to receive your healing from God. Da 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 da